I came in the 8081. I was in Lookout Mountain for one year, and during that year, I spent most of my time looking for property. Uh, and then in 1983, we moved down, 81, 82 up there, 82, 83, we moved down to the Broad Street campus. Uh, it was a great move. It was a hard move because uh, people were out coming off Lookout instead of going up Lookout. But it worked out extremely well to get it done that way. Uh, I would say too, in those early years when we made it, um, the first 10 years, uh, those, are, those are strong shoulders that we stood on. Um, th that's a part of the history that a lot of people have forgotten. The key players were Donovan Graham from Covenant College, Paul Gilchrist who was the board president back then. We also had Marion Smart. Uh, besides that, Richard Hostetter was a hero of mine. He did a lot of the fundraising for it. Hugh McClellan was another one. Fred Shumpert was another one. Charlie Donaldson. Those were the men that I met with early on who said, we have this vision and we want to see it carry through and, and we think you're the guy that leads the charge. And they were very supportive. And then we pulled on other people. Sam Smart came on. John Wright came on from the American Bank and, and others that came along. So as I go through and I think about the people who really, really made a big difference to the school, Often under the radar were those men who I tremendously respect. So they wanted to come off Lookout Mountain and be more accessible to the city of Chattanooga. To do that, they had to find a location. At that particular point in time, we were meeting at the Lookout Mountain Presbyterian Church. Lookout had the high school, middle school. The Reformed Presbyterian had the elementary. And we had a nurture center, a preschool program at the Baptist Church up there. So we were in three different locations. Ultimately, we spent a lot of time looking for a location in the valley where we could start the school. I think we looked at every available piece of property until finally this one, Ed Wright Chevrolet, was for sale. We had no money, we had debt, we couldn't afford it, but we had some very wise men who knew finance as well and knew the right people in town to talk to. SunTrust and Scotty Probasco had been very instrumental in the school being given that, that old dealership that had gone bankrupt. A guy named Richard Hostetter, who was a member of our church, asked me if I could loan the school some forklift trucks and some other equipment to help move different things that they were moving down to the campus. So I said, sure. And he said, hey, and would you be willing to help me out one Saturday? I said, sure. So he had a pickup truck. He came to pick me up early one morning, that Saturday morning. And we spent the whole day hauling things down there to CCS, to the old car dealership. And during the course of that day, he completely sold me on Christian education. Being new Christians, the idea of raising our children at a Christian school really was appealing to me. And I felt like we needed all the help we could get from the church, from the community, and from school. And so that's how we first became interested in and involved in CCS. So in 1982, um, CCS wanted to expand beyond the local neighborhood of Lookout Mountain and started satellite schools in the Hickson area at Valleybrook Presbyterian and on Signal Mountain. And um, I taught out at the Hickson branch for five years and Ellie Hedendorf was the lead teacher out there. Um, Will Davis at that time was principal of the Lookout Mountain branch and so he kind of had oversight over all three elementary schools. My name is Eddie Salter. Uh, I was hired uh, in 1986 by Ellie Hedendorf and Will Davis. Um, it was uh, three schools I worked at, uh, up on Lookout Mountain. Uh, then I went out to Hickson um, at a school out there. And then I ended up back here in the afternoons. So it was three campuses I, I taught at. And I was uh, assistant coach with Coach Irwin, so I had about three or four jobs going at one time. You know, you look back on it now like, how? But uh, it was it was exciting to uh, to be able to to be able to do that. I felt like I was an outsider, you know, uh, being young, coming in, you know, to these guys and teachers like Mr. Fordyce and Mr. Stanton and Mr. Lindley, Miss Cox and you know Miss Will Dreyer. And they just they welcomed me with open arms and. Uh, that, that made a lot of difference. But you know, like Don and the board, how they worked so hard to get everything on one campus. That was one of the biggest changes and biggest uh, things that affected me, to be on one campus. When we finished three, four classrooms in the elementary building, we began to grow so much and attract so many, that summer we had to finish four more. 
And it's interesting, in that purchase, Ed Wright Chevrolet had gone bankrupt. It was a time when prices were high, oil shortages, and so forth. And next to the elementary school was a, a piece of property that Ed Wright owned personally, not the corporation. We wanted that piece of property for a baseball diamond. I went to Ed Wright one day and said, we'd like to buy that piece of property. Do you have a price on it? And here's a man who had just gone through bankruptcy, had lost his business and so forth, and he looked me square in the eye and he said, for the cause of Christian education, I'll give it. So he donated the baseball field to us. Uh, from that point on, we began to build. Well, uh, we still did things pretty much. I mean, there was a contract. Jim Eldridge came in and, and uh, did a lot of renovation and set the walls in and all that sort of stuff. But we, uh, we brought emptied restaurants and had all this kitchen equipment and for a long time kids would sit at um, little tables in a restaurant and you know, slide in, scoot in. Uh, I still can see those things. We had those for a long time. Uh, the, the high school of today was a big empty center room. That's where we'd have our chapel. And then around ringing that empty room were the classrooms. Uh, those classrooms are there to this day you know, one of the soccer fields was basically the beginning of every soccer practice. Is okay guys, 20 minutes, and that meant pick up rocks. And so we'd walk around and pick up rocks, and guys would get their four-wheel, and we'd pull curbing out of the field. And that field would be the area from what today is kind of even with the tennis courts all the way north to the street. We needed a gym. We said we can put a gym in the back of the elementary school, but it's not tall enough. According to regulations, it had to be 20 feet eave height. We said, well, it's not. And finally, Jim Eldridge was the one who said, well, let's measure it. So Richard Hostetter held the ladder. Jim climbed it. It was 21 feet, 6 inches. He said, why in the world would the Lord give us an extra foot and a half? So we looked at it and said, well, with the insulation and the roof that goes on and the beams that come down, you're right at the limit, 20 feet. So everything worked out that way, just the way it had to work. It was miracles all the way around. Subsequently, of course, we bought the high school property. And that's a story in itself because it was a big auto ship dealer as well. So we have what's called the pit, which is a classroom that's sort of a tiered classroom. All the chairs in there were donated because the roundhouse took out the gold circle and we got the gold circle chairs to put in that. It's the alignment pit, but that became a very good classroom for, for social studies and history. But the construction of the buildings was the smallest part. The construction of the kids was eternal. We're constructing the minds of young people. And that's what the construction is all about. This was the early 80s. I was offered um, a position as curriculum director, and um, but also teaching in the high school. Uh, everybody wore three or four large hats at that time. And the school had moved down here. It was chaotic. Um, school. I don't know, double, tripled in enrollment. Um, kids coming from every direction, and by that I mean all sorts of backgrounds. Um, scrambling to try to just keep our heads above water. We still had a student body that hadn't begun to coalesce in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that's institutionally, that's very, very difficult in all sorts of subtle ways that, uh, you know, ways that are hard to measure, but you, you certainly feel it. And uh, that, was, that was really a, a, a major, major challenge. You can't just make a school overnight. And that's kind of what we did, tried to do, by moving down here. Well, I think, you know, when we, when we started out and came down to Chattanooga, there were three things. One, you know, you had the people who, who really had some perceptions of the school, white flight, it's not going to make it, lower academic, it's where the discipline cases go. If they can't get somewhere else, they come here. That was the perception that we had. Then after a while, we were validated because we list the students who made national honor, national merit scholars, and so on and so forth. And then began to be validated. Then there was full accreditation that came in 88. And then of course, the sports program is probably the most visible program uh, early on. And all of a sudden you're starting to win ball games, whether it be soccer or tennis, we run several state championships. Well, all of a sudden you're validated then on that arena. So they're winning awards in the arts and in athletics and in academics. So I think it was at that point that people began to say, there's really something over there that we've underestimated. By the mid-90s, um, 
we had really begun, the situation had really begun to stabilize. Uh, one, we had a core group of faculty have been together and here for, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, we had students uh, who had come out of the elementary school and into the middle school and the high school, so we weren't just picking up kids for their last couple of years of high school. Uh, on the leadership level, um, Mark Davis uh, had really begun to come into his own as an administrator. He began to articulate, um, we need to be organized here, you know, we need to be mentoring new teachers and so forth. So Joanne Irwin and I were sort of the, uh, the lead teachers, she in the math and sciences, me in the humanities. So there, were the, there was the beginning of a, of a sense of organization that had not existed previously. And that really helped. That carried into the, um, the early 2000s. There was just a sense of, of stability. And the kids read that too. Um, they understood that, they sensed it. I think within the school community, we had a pride and knew that we were doing a good job. The Lord was with us and helping us. I think in those early years when we were so small that um, CCS was not known throughout the whole Chattanooga com community. And if it was, it was maybe kind of discounted as, oh, it's just a small school. And I've seen throughout the years how that perception has really changed. Well, I think, you know, a place to grow was our theme back then. And, you know, the, the logo that came up, it was after Psalm 1, verse 3. A tree planted by streams of water to yield fruit in its season. And when we looked at that logo, we said, that, that's a picture of the school. We're going to have fruit growing every season. We're planted by the stream, the Word of God. And so everything we do is going to be focused on that way. We're not trying to compete with anyone. We've set our own sail. This is what we do. We take kids from Christian homes. We nurture these kids. We train them to become impact in culture and society for Christ. That's what we do. And we're gonna strive for excellence. The school was growing leaps and bounds, but the school did not have a lot of resources. It was, it was very hand to mouth. And I know in those early years, um, Hostetter and some of them would, would tell you that they literally had to pass a hat at board meetings to make sure they're gonna meet payroll, that kind of thing. It was not quite that hand to mouth by the time we got on that campus, but still stewardship and frugality were the watchwords. And Don Hallwarda was our superintendent and Don Hallwarda was perfect for that. And to put bleachers in the gym, we went to Tullahoma High School took a bunch of kids with us. We worked for one week and took all the bleachers apart, hauled them back to Chattanooga, put them all back together. When I called to buy them, they said, well, what are you gonna bid on for these bleachers? And I said, well, I'd like to um, bid $1,000 for all of your bleachers. Well, they said, okay, are you paying us or are we paying you? I said, it can go either way. So they paid us. We had all that wood and all the bleachers that were in the old gym uh, at that time. Things worked out like that. I would go home at night and I'd say to my wife, I did not see the hand of the Lord today. I saw both hands every day. It was just an incredible experience, the greatest faith exercise in faith I've ever been in. And the people who helped make this school, all the parents, we had parent labor days, the kids cleaned their rooms, the teachers did all they could. They'd come back in the summer. There was a lot of ownership, you know. Um, certainly, Tim building furniture and David working on the fields. Um, others of us working in less physical and tangible ways. Um, if you needed furniture for your classroom, you built it. You know, you just went out and bought the material and you did it. Um, you didn't expect that someone else was gonna do it because there wasn't a someone else. Different people are doing different things, you know. Just because, uh, one, they were good at it, um, it needed to be done, they just stepped up and did it. Many people were here, I'm talking now about the, the teachers, were here out of a sense of, of uh, commitment, um, certainly to Christ, commitment to the, the whole idea of Christian education. You know, so everybody was fired up and everybody was helping out. Um, one of the most interesting for me fundraising things that we did in those days was the auction. 
Auction was a lot of work, a lot of work. I mean, the payback on the effort was <laughs> not worth it, but, but we did it every single year. But the funny part about it was that there were two items, an old boat and a stuffed sailfish that perennially were auctioned off. But then you'd have Hostetter and Hugh o. McClellan and, and a few other guys that would always bid up this boat and this sailfish against each other. And finally, somebody would end up you know, winning the sailfish or winning the boat and the auction would be a success. But we also did just a lot of plain old fundraising. We just got out there and asked people to help us, to give to the school, um, to help us become what God wanted us to be. And the motivation was to keep Christian education affordable for all Christian families that were interested in coming to CCS. We didn't want to turn away any family because they couldn't afford it, if, we, if at all possible. But we also needed to be able to attract and retain these Christian teachers who were experts in their own discipline, whether it's history or science or math or whatever, and to be able to teach it from a reform perspective. So that was sort of the, the tension that we had. And we ultimately ended up deciding to have this endowment campaign that would enable us to subsidize teachers' salaries so that all that burden wouldn't fall on the families, but we could still attract and retain these teachers. I think during those years, and really through all my years here at CCS, that the faculty has always been totally committed to, one, working together, and um, making sure that the education our students get is an excellent education. So always striving to learn more, um, get new ideas, look at the latest research and kind of balance that with what we might know as experienced teachers and um, working together and always, I think throughout all those years, what's always been obvious is that this is God's school and that his hand is in it and that um, really have a commitment to teaching from that biblical perspective. And I would say overall, uh, the school represents a child. It grew on Lookout Mountain, it was born there, 10 years, it struggled the way a baby does, it wakes up at night, there's things you gotta take care of you never thought about. And then we got to the era when we moved off, and I would say my tenure here, it was 30 years, but the first few years, uh, the 83 to 88 range, the growth years, I would say that, that particular period in time were the adolescent years. If you think of an adolescent, it's gangly, it's got problems here, you got discipline issues. We had the growth pains and we kept growing and building and everything. Well, after we got through adolescence, we got our policies in place, we got straightened out, people bought into the mission. And once that happened, then we moved into young adulthood. And now I see the school and I say, we're, we're pretty close to maturity. And uh, now we're looking at the next generation and the next generation. So the school is here to stay 50 years is a long time. A lot of people didn't give us 20. Um, but now here we are at 50 and it's going strong and the Lord continues to bless it as I look at what's happening here in the school. Teachers have the same commitment. Students are proud of it. You see it all over the city. And all of a sudden, our school has become one of the leaders in the community. And it's here to stay. And uh, I'm very, very proud of the school.